Hey everyone, it's Weiss, and for today's video, I'll be sharing all the books that I've read this year. I'll be giving my quick thoughts and review of books slash book series, rate them, and by the end of each discussion, I'll answer a question about that series. Last thing before getting into it, I'm going to be including books I DNF this year, but I'm not going to rate them, because in my opinion, in order for me to rate a book, I have to fully read it in order to rate it. I'll be talking about a lot of books, so let's get into it. The first series that I read this year was the Heroes of Olympus series by Rick Riordan. If you've watched my separate videos of each book in this series, then you then I really enjoyed reading the Heroes of Olympus. For this, I'll rate them separately. 4.5 out of 5 stars for The Lost Hero, 4.8 out of 5 stars for The Son of Neptune, 5 out of 5 stars for The Mark of Athena, 4.7 out of 5 stars for The House of Hades, and 5 out of 5 stars for The Blood of Olympus. If you don't know what the Heroes of Olympus series is about, and you're interested, or you want to get into it, it happens months after the events of PJO, and it focuses on seven demigods who are prophesied to defeat Gaia, or the Earth Goddess. And these seven demigods are Percy Jackson, Annabeth Chase, Jason Grace, Leo Valdez, Piper McLean, Hazel Levesque, and Frank Zhang. Throughout this series, they go through a bunch of adventures until the final battle against Gaia in the Blood of Olympus. So for this series, the question is, which do I prefer, the Heroes of Olympus or Percy Jackson? For me, I'm picking the Heroes of Olympus. Don't get me wrong, I love the PJO books, but I think that I prefer the Heroes of Olympus series because in that series, the stakes are higher, the characters are more mature, and Rick Riordan's world expanded to the Romans and not just the Greeks. Plus, this series gave me a lot of new characters to love, and I just love the Heroes of Olympus to the point that I want the PJO show when Disney Plus finished so that they would already adopt the Heroes of Olympus. Also, after reading all Rick Riordan's Riordanverse series, I love the Heroes of Olympus series the best. So overall, Heroes of Olympus over PJO. The next series I read this year is The Legend Trilogy by Mary Lou. If you watched my top 5 dystopians to read video, then you'd know that I recommended this trilogy there. I also mentioned in that video that I haven't read this series, and now that I've read it, I'm sorry to say, but I didn't like it. Because of the hype this series got, I really had high expectations, and okay, I have to say something first. I don't think this is a bad series. Seriously, I don't. Like, I see its potential, but it just didn't hit the mark for me. I'd rate the first book, Legend, a 4.7 out of 5 stars. Like, it was an okay book for me. And then I tried reading the second book, Prodigy, and I DNF'd it. It just didn't hold my attention, and I was just dragging myself to read this book. So I just decided to stop it. And because I DNF'd it, I'm not gonna rate anymore. I think the reason why I didn't like this series is because of the plot. I mentioned in that video that this series has so much hype and praise, and I had really high expectations for it. I don't think that the plot was bad. The world building was really interesting, but the plot was just... how do I explain this? Too basic? Okay, so the first book goes around the murder of Juni Paris's brother Matthias, and they is suspected to be the criminal when in fact he wasn't. And I knew that Mary Lou, or the author of this trilogy, was trying to make the big reveal of the real murder suspenseful and shocking, but I already guessed who it was, and my guess was right. Obviously, I'm not going to say who because of a lot of spoilers, but yeah, it just seemed pretty obvious to me. Also, the relationship that that person had with Matthias... You know, I'm not gonna finish that sentence. That'll definitely spoil you for the first few chapters of Prodigy, but anyway. The romance that bloomed between Day and June was really predictable to the fact that I'm talking about it in this video because I think most people will instantly see it. I mean, I shipped them, but it just felt too insta-lovey for me. Like at first, June was all, I'm gonna kill whoever did this to Matthias and that person's gonna pay up, and the next thing I know, she's kissing Day and declaring her love for him. And I'm just like, okay, are you gonna kill him or what? So, the question for this series is, was it worth the hype? For me, no, it wasn't. I think this book series is mediocre at best, but it's not a bad book. It's just not a favorite of mine, and I'm just in the middle when it comes to this series. 
The next series I read is The Lunar Chronicles by Marissa Meyer. I don't think I've mentioned this series yet in my channel, and I think the reason why I haven't is because I haven't finished this series. So to give a quick overview, The Lunar Chronicles is a fairy tale retelling of Cinderella, Little Red Riding Hood, Rapunzel, and Snow White. The books are set in a futuristic world with people living with cyborgs and robots, and people have also colonized the moon, and they're called Lunars. Hence the name, The Lunar Chronicles. Also, Lunars have special powers, and we follow these cast of characters. Lynn Cinder, a cyborg mechanic, Scarlett Benoit, a half-lunar farmer, Cress, a quarantine tech genius, Thorn, a former prisoner and pilot of the entire crew, Winter, a lunar princess who swore to never use her powers again, and Prince Kai, the new emperor of the Eastern Commonwealth, whose life is in danger because Queen Levana, or the Queen of the Lunars, is planning to marry him and kill him the next day in order to have the control of both the moon and Kai's nation. Since this is another series, I'll rate the books separately. 4.8 out of 5 for Cinder, 4 out of 5 for Scarlet, and 4.7 out of 5 for Cress. I'm not writing the last book, which is Winter, because I DNF'd that book. It just didn't hold my interest, and I felt like the pacing was badly handled in that book. So, for this series, the question is, who is my favorite character? I love almost all the characters in this series, but I think I love Cinder the best. Cinder is a really kind person, despite her stepmother's attitude towards her, and I especially loved her relationship with Prince Kai. A side note, the scene where Kai kissed her for the first time, and this fanart of that scene is just so satisfying to me. Overall, Cinder is my favorite character. The next series is the Magnus Chase and the Gods of Asgard trilogy. I've mentioned this trilogy a couple of times in my previous videos, and I just love this series. For those of you who don't know what Magnus Chase is about, it focuses around Norse mythology, and we follow Magnus Chase, who was a 16-year-old teenager living in the streets for two years ever since his mother's death. The book opens up to Annabeth finding Magnus and placing posters of him all around Boston, and Magnus is forced to go to his uncle Randolph. After meeting his uncle, Magnus is faced with Surtur, who was a fire giant, and Magnus tries to defend himself, but in doing so, he died. I know it's weird for a main character to die in the first three chapters of the first book, but for Magnus, that's when his story really begins. He enters Hotel Valhalla, which is a place where Odin, or the Allfather of Norse mythology, collects fallen heroes in order to fight during Ragnarok, which is the end of all worlds and days. And the rest of the book and series is a full adventure to stop Loki from starting up Ragnarok. Since this is a trilogy, I'll write them separately. 4.8 out of 5 for The Sword of Summer, 5 out of 5 for The Hammer of Thor, and 4.5 out of 5 for The Ship of the Dead. For this series, the question is, what do I think of Fiero Chase? Fiero Chase is the ship name for Magnus and Alex Fiero, and this ship was the first LGBTQ plus couple I've read in the Riordanverse. And yes, I read Magnus Chase before the Trials of Apollo, meaning I haven't read about Will and Nico's relationship. So going back, I would say that I love Fiero Chase, but it didn't start out that way. I was actually spoiled that Magnus and Alex would end up together, and in the Hammer of Thor, when you first meet Alex, Magnus is suddenly seeing Alex as attractive, and Hapward even told Magnus to stop gawking at her slash him. And Magnus was just so flustered around Alex for some reason, and like they and Yu's relationship from the Legend trilogy, I thought it was a bit too insta-lovey. But the last book on Magnus Chase changed my mind. Magnus and Alex bonded, defended, and fought together in that book, and that really strengthened their relationship. So, because of all that, I love them together. The next book series I read is the Trials of Apollo series. To give a quick overview, the series is set after the events of both the Heroes of Olympus and PJO, and we see Apollo cast down by his father Zeus and his turn mortal. Now mortal, Apollo is tasked to free all the oracles before the Triumvirate or an organization of three Roman emperors could control them in the future. I love this series so much, and from all the Riordanverse series, I would say it is my third favorite. Apollo as a narrator is hilarious, 
and the lessons he slowly learns while he's mortal, and how it slowly impacts Apollo really developed him to be a better person. This is another series, so I'll rate them one by one. 5 out of 5 for the Hidden Oracle, 4.5 out of 5 for the Dark Prophecy, 4.7 out of 5 for the Burning Maze, 5 out of 5 for the Tyrant's Tomb, and 5 out of 5 for the Tower of Nero. So the question is, what's my favorite book in this series? For me, it has to be The Tower of Nero. The Tower of Nero is by far one of the best books I've ever read, and Rick Riordan absolutely played with my emotions in this book. Ending and finishing this book made me laugh and cry at the same time, and I was just an emotional mess. I love this book so much, and if I could, I would rate it a 7 million out of 5 stars, because it's just that good. The characters, the plot, the presence of Solangelo, and Percy and Annabeth in this book, you know, thinking about it right now is making me teary-eyed, and that's saying something, because it's been at least 4 to 5 months since I finished reading The Trials of Apollo, and I'm still crying. So yeah, The Tower of Nero is definitely the best one for me. The next series is The Mortal Instruments by Cassandra Clare. I'm showing the first four books only because, until now, I haven't read either The City of Lost Souls or City of Heavenly Fire, which are books 5 and 6 in that series. So The Mortal Instruments is about our main character, Clary Frey, and she enters a nightclub. In that place, she witnesses a murder, and it turns out that nobody but her saw it. She soon realizes that the murderers were half-human, half-angel warriors called Shadow Hunters, and the entire adventure starts from there. So the reason why I haven't finished this series is because I don't really feel the urge to do so. I'm more contented with the ending we got in the City of Glass, and after reading reviews on City of Lost Souls and City of Heavenly Fire, I decided to stop. I don't know if I'll ever get back to them, but as of now, I wish the series was a trilogy instead. So I'll be reading the first four books. 4.8 out of 5 for The City of Bones, 5 out of 5 for City of Ashes, 5 out of 5 again for City of Glass, and a 4 out of 5 for City of Fallen Angels. So the question for the series is, who is my least favorite character? I think it would be Valentine Morgenstern. Not only did he do a lot of horrible things in the series, but the fact that he was okay with making experiments on his own kids is insane, and I just didn't like him at all. So yeah. Valentine's my least favorite character. So the next book isn't a series. It's a standalone novel called Lore by Alexandra Bracken. If you didn't know, Alexandra Bracken is also the author of the Darkest Minds trilogy, and seeing that I really liked that trilogy, I was really excited to get into Lore. Lore centers on Greek mythology, and if you've seen my older videos, then you'd know I'm a big fan of that mythology. So Lore follows our main character, well, yeah, her name's Lore, and she is a descendant of Perseus, one of the greatest Greek heroes and a personal favorite of mine to the fact that I made a video about him. So if you want to check that out, it's linked down below. So the world is set after a major rebellion the 12 Olympians had, and that resulted to Zeus punishing them during the Agon, which was an event when the gods turned mortal and there are hunters who could kill them and take their position as a god. These hunters are descendants of ancient Greek heroes like Lore. But Lore has been trying to put her past behind her ever since a rival hunter killed her entire family before her eyes, and she's been trying to move on from that. I'm sorry to say, but I did not like this book. The writing style was as good as the Darkest Minds trilogy, but the plot really dragged at a lot of places, and I had a hard time connecting with the characters. What really threw me off was when Athena was also a part of the gods being punished. Because arguably, Athena is Zeus's most favorite child, and the rebellion the book is talking about really happened in mythology, and Athena was a part of it. She rebelled against her father alongside Apollo and Poseidon. But after that, Zeus punished both Apollo and Poseidon, stripping them of their godly powers and making them work manually. But through it all, Athena didn't get punished, simply because Zeus loved her the most. So for this book to add Athena and the Agon really confused me, and I wanted to know what kind of rebellion happened, because it made Zeus punish his most favorite daughter. 
I don't actually know if they explained the rebellion because I DNF'd this book when I was at least 8 chapters into it. So I went through reviews and I was glad to see that I was not alone with questioning the rebellion. So for this book, the question is, was it worth the wait? For me, no, it wasn't. Reading a DNF in this book really made me feel disappointed and what's sad is that I think that the plot is good and it has potential but it was just executed badly. The next series I read is The King Chronicles. If you want a full review on this trilogy, then you can check a separate video on that. So since this is a trilogy, I'll rate them once again one by one. 4.5 out of 5 for The Red Pyramid, 5 out of 5 for The Throne of Fire, and 5 out of 5 once more for The Serpent's Shadow. I would say that The King Chronicles is a really underrated series, and not that many people talk about it in the fandom. So, if you're one of those Rayordanverse fans who haven't read the series, this trilogy focuses on Egyptian mythology, and we follow two siblings named Carter and Sadie Kane. Carter and Sadie lived apart ever since their mother's death, with Sadie living with her grandparents in London, and Carter constantly traveling around the world with his dad. The two of them can only visit each other twice a year, and the trilogy opens to one of those two days. So, the question for this series is, who's my favorite couple? So in this trilogy, we have two main couples, Zarthur, or the Carter and Zia pairing, and the Sadie, Anubis, and Walt pairing. So for this question, I'm picking Zarthur, because personally, I've been rooting for them to end up together since book one, and their relationship is really sweet, and I was so glad that they ended up together in the end. The next series is the Infernal Devices trilogy. Once again, if you want to see an in-depth review of this trilogy, then you can check out another video for that. So the Infernal Devices is the prequel series to the Mortal Instruments, and it centers around our main character, Tessa Gray, and she is about to meet her brother, Nate, in London. Things go terribly wrong when Tessa is captured by the Dark Sisters and is told to change, and the entire adventure starts from there. So here are the ratings. 5 out of 5 for Clockwork Angel, 4 out of 5 for Clockwork Prince, and 4.8 for Clockwork Princess. So the question for this series is, which do I prefer, Wessa or Jessa? So Wessa is the ship name for the Will and Tessa pairing, and Jessa is the ship name for the Gem and Tessa pairing. Right now, I would say I shipped them both, but it didn't start out that way. Like, at Book 1, aka Clockwork Angel, I was hoping for Tessa to end up with Jem, because I just felt like the bond she had with Jem was stronger than what she had with Will, and based on the comments I've heard from fans, it's quite unpopular to say that. Most people preferred Wessa over Jessa, because they feel like Tessa saw Jem as more of a sibling and not as a romantic partner. But for me, it was Jessa. But... Ending the book series made me ship both of them, so I guess I'm going with the standard Jem, Tessa, and Will pairing because I can't decide, and most fans have agreed with this kind of ship. The next book I read was Caraval by Stephanie Garber. This is the first book in the Caraval trilogy, which is a young adult fantasy series that is about two sisters named Donatella and Scarlet Drogna, who received tickets to the show called Caraval. Caraval is a mysterious play and show, and it just tricks the audience with illusions and magic tricks. Scarlet has been wanting to go to Caraval for years, and now that they have the opportunity, they plan to escape their abusive father and watch the show. I'll rate this book a 4 out of 5. It was a pretty interesting read, but at the same time, it was a bit of a big mess for me. I mean, it's not a bad book. The pacing was not really good. The characters were okay, the plot was... Okay, do I really need to talk about that ending? You know what, okay. So the plot really disturbed me because things played out, and then the author, Stephanie Garber, she was like, yeah, that happened, but wait, it didn't, kind of aspect, and that just really annoyed me towards the end. It was an okay book to me, like I'm in the middle when it comes to writing this book. It's just not my favorite, and again, in the middle. So the question here is, what did I feel about the ending of this book? Before getting into my thoughts, I have to give a spoiler warning for Caraval because I can't talk about the ending without giving a lot of spoilers. 
So if you don't want to hear them, just skip a couple of seconds of this video. So okay, I would say at the ending and how things played out was really just wow. <laughs> I didn't expect what happened, like Donatella dying and then suddenly she's alive and I'm told she has the most perspectives in the next book and I can't even gather my thoughts as to what in the world just happened there in that ending. So despite that though, I think that it was quite a unique way of how the author resolved their issue with their dad and how it was revealed that Donatella made a deal with Legend prior to the events of this book. And yeah, like I said earlier, it's okay. I don't know if I'll continue with this trilogy, but so far, I don't have any intentions of doing so. The next book series I read is The Ember in the Ashes series by Saba Tahir. The Ember in the Ashes is a young adult fantasy dystopian series, and it is about two main characters named Laia and Elias. Laia's brother has been captured by the evil marshals because of some vital information the marshals don't want anybody but themselves to know, and Laia has to do whatever she can to save her brother. Elias, meanwhile, is a student in Blackleaf Academy and is from the Marshalls, but he does not like how the government treats the scholars or Laia's people. He plans to escape Blackleaf during his graduation day, and Laia and Elias's paths cross when Laia is going to go undercover in Blackleaf, and the entire adventure starts. I read the series recently, and as of now, I've read the first three books. Okay, so technically I read and finished the first two books, but I didn't finish the third book. I love the storyline the series follows, the writing is amazing and well written, but it has the quality of not making the reader as invested into the story. There were times when I had to drag myself when reading these books and enjoy them, and the reason why I didn't finish the third book was because of two reasons. One, I was just putting this book off and not reading it. And two, because while I was midway into that book, I got the hardback edition of Daughter of the Deep, which, if you didn't know, is Rick Riordan's most recent release, and the most anticipated book of 2021 for me. And I think if you've seen throughout my channel, I'm a big fan of Rick Riordan, having read almost all of his books and talked about them in my videos, so when you compare a book from my favorite author and a book I'm barely invested in, I just had to drop Reaper at the gates and pick up Daughter of the Deep. So here's my ratings for the first two books. 4.8 out of 5 for The Ember and the Ashes, and 4 out of 5 for A Torch Against the Night. So the question for this book series is, which do I prefer? Laia and Elias, or Elias and Helene? I'm going against a popular opinion here. I'm picking Elias and Helene. Before you guys react, hear me out. Laia and Elias barely knew each other in the first book, and somehow ended up falling in love. And Elias and Helene, they've known each other since they were six. And it's obvious by the first book that Helene has feelings for Elias, and Elias reciprocated them. You know, I think the reason why I preferred Elias and Helene together, because them ending up together would mean the childhood friends to lovers trope, which is something I really love when it comes to books. But I'm standing my ground. I wanted Elias and Helene to end up together over Laia and Elias. The next book I read is The Daughter of the Deep by Rick Riordan. Like I said earlier, Daughter of the Deep is the most recent release of Rick Riordan, and unlike most of his books, it isn't part of the Riordanverse. It's a science fiction adventure book that talks about our main character, Anna Dakar, who studies in Harding Pencroft Academy. Anna's parents died two years ago during a scientific research, but how they died was never elaborated. Anna is about to go into this trial slash competition when suddenly their school is destroyed and a traitor is said to be among them. I wouldn't go into full discussion of this book because I'm planning to make a separate review of this book in a different video. So I'd rate The Daughter of the Deep a 5 out of 5 stars. It was amazing, worth the wait and the hype, and it was better than I expected. The ending made me a bit teary-eyed, and the plot twist, I can't even go without mentioning it. I never expected it at all. I thought that character was clean, but what the character did, I have no words for that. So the question for this book is, do we want a sequel? As far as I know, it's a standalone book, but right now, I searched it up and it turns out that it's a start to a sci-fi series. I would absolutely love that. 
I don't know if Anna fully forgave the traitor by the end, but I want to see how that plays out, and I want to get to know the characters a bit more. So for this question, I would say yes. I want a sequel. The next book series I read is The Six of Crows Duology by Lee Bardugo. If you didn't know, it's a sequel to the Grisha trilogy, or the Shadow and Bone trilogy, and it focuses on six main characters. First, we have Cass Breger, the leader of the gang called the Dregs in Ketterdam, Inej Gaffa, a spy who was once an acrobat, Jesper Fahey, a sharpshooter who was once a farmer from Novi Zem, Matthias Helver, a former Drew school from Fyrda, Nina Zenik, a Grisha heartrender who has a history with Matthias, and Wyland Van Eck, the son of Jan Van Eck, and a very smart kid. Altogether, they are a group of six, and the Dregs, aka the organization Kaz rules over, has a part called the Crow Club, thus the name Six of Crows. I recently read and finished this duology, and I have to say, this series is one of the best books I've ever read. Lee Bardugo, or the author of this series and the Grishaverse, has this way of making you connect with the characters so easily through flashbacks and changes in perspective. And I'm so happy for the Shadow and Bone series on Netflix. I haven't watched it yet because I just read this duology and not the actual Shadow and Bone trilogy, but I'm hoping to get into it in the future. This is a duology, meaning two books in the series, and here's my rating. A 5 out of 5 stars for Six of Crows, and another 5 out of 5 stars for Crooked Kingdom. I would definitely recommend this series to anyone interested in a big heist kind of story, or fantasy in general, because I think that the world building Lee Bardugo has in the Grishaverse is just beautiful. So for this series, the question is, what did I feel about the ending in Crooked Kingdom? So for this, I need to give a spoiler warning for both Six of Crows and Crooked Kingdom, so you can just skip this part if you like. Okay, the ending. There were a lot of points in Crooked Kingdom that made me cry. Like Kaz's line, I would come for you, and if I couldn't walk, I'd crawl to you. And no matter how broken we were, we'd fight our way out together. Knives drawn, pistols blazing, because that's what we do. We never stop fighting. That line literally broke me, and the fact that Cass searched the world for Inej's parents by the end just made me tear up so much. And don't get me started on the simple line, is my tie straight. Like, I cannot. <laughs> I also love the part that it was mentioned that Wyland and Jesper stayed together in Van Eck's mansion, and the fact that Wyland and Jesper were together was also pretty great. I think I can't not mention the fact that Matthias died. That was honestly really shocking. Like, by the end of it, I thought it would always be Six of Crows, but by the entire ending of this duology, it just became Five of Crows. And overall, finishing this entire duology made me pretty emotional and yeah, I was just an emotional mess. Just like what happened to me in the Tower of Nero. The last book that I read this year was Dune by Frank Herbert. While I'm editing this video, I'm currently reading it, and probably when the video is already up, I'm already finished. So Dune is a classic science fiction novel, and it is about our main character, Paul Atreides. And his family is about to inherit this planet called Arrakis, or Dune. It's almost a barren wasteland, being filled with so much sand and big monsters called sandworms, but the planet is very important because it contains something called spice, and spice is this drug that extends a person's life and just enhances or develops their ability as a person. That's pretty much what I could say without spoiling it, so I'm sorry if the description is pretty vague, because the book is pretty deep when it comes to the lore, the terms, and the world building aspect. Jumping into the classic, I have expected the slow paceness the book has. It has this kind of quality that two characters have like a back and forth conversation to inform the reader what is happening in this book, and there are times when I just wanted the author to just get straight to the point and get into the entire action instead of making two characters talk nonstop. But I'm still reading this book, and I think it's pretty worth it if you gave it the time and effort to get into the couple of chapters of just talking. So the question of the book is, is it harder to understand than Tolkien's writing? For me, I disagree. Seeing as it was a classic, I have expected a quite hard writing to understand, and sure there were times that made me go, what in the world just happened while reading this book? 
but compared to Tolkien or the author of The Lord of the Rings, which I read last year, then I would say that I preferred Frank Herbert's writing style and it was way easier to get through. Probably because Frank published Dune at 1965, whereas Tolkien published The Hobbit around 1937, and the language during Tolkien's time would have been much more deeper, I guess? So, those are all the books that I've read this year. How about you? What's the best book you read this 2021? Let me know in the comments down below.